Hello and welcome to this video in the series for mobile networks. I would like to explain the media access layer for the ZigBee standard in this video. The ZigBee standard is actually specified for the first two layers in the IEEE standard 802.15.4 and uh, in the standard specification there especially are specify the physical layer and the Mac layer. So the first two layers of the OC layer model. And first let's have a look at the architecture. The architectures that are possible when building a ZigBee network. There's a start topology which you can see here and uh, you can find this kind of star topology in other standards as well, in the Bluetooth standard for example. So you have a central coordinator in the network and you have several associated nodes like the green ones here. In the ZigBee standard you have specified name for these associated nodes, the central node and associated nodes. One is the coordinator, the coordinator in the center of the network and this is a full function device called also FFD. And the associated uh, nodes are the RFD, the reduced function devices. So the actual function is reflected in the name. Somehow the coordinator in the center contains more functionality and the nodes, the surrounding nodes, the RFDs contain less functionality. Communication takes place then in a PAN in a personal area network, which is a wireless network that is somehow in the personal area of a person, in a personal area around a person or around a small workstation in a small area. And these lines, again, here between the RFD and the FFD, trace the connection. So there is a connection between this RFD and the FFD and the others as well which of course is not wired, but is achieved through radio communication. So we talk about radio communication anyway, so the lines mean connection by radio communication. Another possibility in this setting is to set up a meshed network. The algorithms for the meshing are not specified in the IEEE 802.15.4 standard, the meshing algorithms need to be set on top of these two layers, these two first layers in the standard. So you have to implement appropriate additional layers and therewith you can create with the appropriate algorithms a mesh network. These are so-called routing algorithms for the forwarding of the data packets from one node in the network to another far distant node. So for example from this RFD via this nodes, intermediate nodes, to another RFD at the end of the network. In principle, as in similar standards, for example in Bluetooth, it is possible to apply these routing algorithms for meshing and you apply this to the actual core standard to set on top something which is able to do the meshing by operating the nodes in full function devices and uh, do the meshing there and the reduced function devices they are then also possible to support the meshing. For example the node could operate in an alternating mode at one time it's present in a network as a reduced function node and then at another time it is uh, present in another network as a full function device maybe or again as a reduced function device. And therewith, with this, uh, with this approach of the meshing on top of the first two layers, you create this overlay. You create an overlay for the mesh and for forwarding the messages through the network, through the entire network, not only one pawn. 
a special feature of the standard of the IEEE standard 802.15.4 is that it was developed for devices with a relatively low energy supply. And this can be, for example, sensors uh, which are distributed somewhere in the building, distributed somewhere in applications, in industrial applications, and uh, these may not be able to charge daily, but maybe weekly, monthly, yearly, as you can do with smartphones. Uh, smartphones you can charge daily, but uh, these sensors are, don't, don't have a power supply available in such a frequency. And if you think about these sensors, then you might replace the batteries at most one, once a year or so, but uh, not every week, every month. So you want to have these sensors for a long time in the field, and you don't want to charge the battery often. And that is why you have to save energy in these networks. And one way to save the energy is to communicate as little as possible. Of course, this is only possible if you only have a small amount of data to transfer. For example, this standard is not suitable for, for internet browsing because you need much larger amounts of data. And you communicate much more frequently if you do internet browsing. If you imagine that you want to transport smaller data packets for temperatures, this is suitable standard because such a temperature change is relatively takes place relatively slowly and if you send a data update every few minutes this is still sufficient for temperature controlled processes so we can conclude for the main purpose of the standard the special applications are addressed especially for energy conservation and there is for slow processes which are somehow connected to the sensors and to understand this uh, energy conservation in more detail we now look at the media access layer which was developed in the IEEE 802.15.4 Zigbee standard especially for the energy efficiency here we see the so-called superframe. And this superframe structure is used in the Zigbee standard as uh, the main structure of the packets. And it consists actually of an active phase, the blue and the red start here, and the passive phase. Passive phase where we have no communication at all. The active phase is initiated by a so-called beacon package. And then the active phase can begin. For example, the participants can communicate actively in this active phase. No communication is permitted in the passive phase. A central coordinator, a full function device, would not have to listen to the communication. This means that a data packet which would be sent in this passive phase from the reduced function device to the full function device would not be received by the coordinator because the coordinator is not actively listening in the passive phase. On the other hand, the active phase which is uh, initiated by this beacon packet is uh, lasting for a certain time. The time is specified in the beacon package and this means that the reduced function devices then are able to send their packages during this active phase to the coordinator. And with a certain probability the packets will also arrive at the full function device at the coordinator. Why now with a certain probability? Because here we have a collision prone medium. Especially this active phase is collision prone. So we do not always have a fixed allocation of time slots to each participant of the communication. But we have competition for the medium, like in CSMA, for the radio channel, the competition. 
And this means that loss might occur during this active phase because the data packets may collide and then they are destroyed. And the collision can occur when several reduced function devices, for example this one and this one here, want to say send at the same time to the coordinator and due to the hidden terminal problem they might not hear each other that there is another reduced function device sending and then the collision occurs in the coordinator and the coordinator cannot detect properly the packet, the data packet. The beacon packet here at the beginning, the red one, is um, sent by the full function device to all other reduced function devices which hear the communication. That means that it is sent to all devices surrounding this coordinator here. The reduced function devices then receive this beacon packet and know about the parameter for the communication. So parameters are, uh, for example, the time for the active phase, how long it may last. And that means the reduced function devices then know how long they can try to send their messages to the coordinator. This is the length of the active phase. After the active phase, in the passive phase, no more communication is allowed or the central coordinator would, for example, not listen longer in this active phase. Another information in the beacon package is how long it takes from one beacon packet to the next beacon packet until the next beacon packet is sent out and until the next active phase can start again like you can see here as a start phase with a beacon packet with a red beacon packet and then with a blue phase with a blue active phase again this implicitly then determines that the duration of the passive phase so after the active phase until the next active phase begins there's the passive phase and this is then of course the time between two beacon packages the duration of the passive phase is then the time between two beacon packages minus the time of the active phase and we will see that in a minute how we can calculate that. And as said before, you can configure now this, these two phases with different parameters. For example, you can say how long the active phase may last and how long the uh, time is between two consecutive beacon packets. And also you may tell the reduced function device how many time slots are available for receiving and sending the data packets from the reduced function devices or to the reduced function devices during the active phase. Now to determine this uh, super frame structure, there are two parameters that are crucial. One is the super frame order, SO, and the other is the beacon order, BO. In the picture here you can see how these two parameters impact the time between the beacon packets and the time for the active phase. The beacon order on the one hand is here in this formula as an exponent, 2 to the power of BO, times a certain constant, a base super frame duration. And if you calculate that, you get the beacon interval time, the time between two consecutive beacons. This a base super frame duration is a constant, a constant um, around 15 milliseconds. So you can calculate by trying different BOs how long the beacon interval could be if you configure different values from 0 to 14 for BO. The same is valid for the super frame order. The super frame order impacts 
the super frame duration SD here and again with the same constant with this the constant which is uh, about 50 milliseconds long and again if you vary the super frame order between 0 and 14 then you can calculate how long an active phase can be starting from 15 milliseconds as the minimum up to several minutes and we also have some restrictions for the super frame order and the beacon order that means that both can be at in the minimum zero super frame order zero and beacon order zero and at the maximum 14 and as another restriction there is uh, the super frame order always smaller or equal than the beacon order and with this restriction you can vary SO and BO in a with a certain strategy and you can reach um, certain relations between the active and the passive phase. So if the full function devices first send the beacon package then all participating reduced function devices know how long the active phase will be, how long they have time to um, send their messages and how long they have to wait until the next beacon package is sent. These two parameters, uh, beacon order and super frame order, are in the in the first package here, in this beacon package, and all reduced function devices which participate in the PAN then know about this configuration of the super frame, of the certain super frame in the PAN. And now you can play with these two parameters, the super frame order and the beacon order. You can vary them between 0 and 14 and you can combine different uh, SO values and BO values in order to reach different relations between active and passive phase. And that means that you could either operate in a very energy conserving mode where you save a lot of energy then you make a short active phase for example and a long passive phase so you have to wait a long time from beacon package to beacon package or you communicate more often you uh, configure the passive phase to a shorter time and then you have to be active quite often and here in this uh, picture I have two extreme configurations for the beacon order and the super frame order as you can see here in the first part here we see that beacon order and super frame order are set to the same value to zero and that means that the time between two consecutive beacon packages is 15 milliseconds and as you can see the active phase is also 15 milliseconds long so after the beacon package is sent, one active phase of 50 milliseconds, and then immediately again the next beacon package is sent by the coordinator and the next active phase takes place. So actually there's no passive phase and you are active 100% of the time. Another extreme could be then you configure the beacon order to 14 and the super frame order to 0. And that means that you have a short active phase, 15 milliseconds, and a very long passive phase, because the time between two beacons is 252 seconds. So more than four minutes waiting between two beacon packages. And therewith you get an activity to active to passive relation of 1 to around 16,000. So very low active time and a long passive time. What can this be useful for now? I mentioned earlier that uh, if you observe a temperature for example, the temperature changes in the range of minutes for example in a room and then it will to be totally okay if you check these uh, temperatures only in the range of minutes because it cannot change so quickly anyway. 
and if you then detect a change after some minutes let's say you have this you have the temperature checking configured so that you wait for around four minutes um, after each sensing then it would not impact the control loop negatively if you just sense that seldomly for the temperature changes you would still have enough time to react with heating for example the room or cooling down the room if you check it in the range of minutes so for example in this case you could say that you make an active phase of 50 milliseconds like here in this uh, second extreme example and then you wait around four minutes for the next speaking package and then you are again active after four minutes and check for the temperature so that's it for the first introduction into the standard 802.15.4 we see that we have a basic communication structure we see that we have a basic architecture like this pan i showed before and we see that we can vary the active phase and the passive phase like you can see here between two uh, extreme relations between 100% and only a few percent of the active phase and this is basically also the main characteristic of this Zigbee standard that you can achieve such a good energy conservation with this kind of relation of the active to the passive phase the parameters therefore are the beacon order and the super frame order b o and s o and these parameters are transported in the beacon package